Good morning, church. We got a full service, so we're going to start right on time. Stand with me, and let's sing together. Let's sing praises to our King. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my health and salvation. All ye who hear now to His temple draw near, join me in glad and
are here to worship the King this morning, and uh, this isn't something we mess around doing. This is serious business. The God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords is in our midst, and he's called us together because he wants to do something important in our life. Can you imagine if you got a personal invite to the coronation of the King of Britain yesterday? You would have been like, wow, I got invited personally. I want you to know that God wants you personally to be here today. I don't know what he wants to do in you. I don't know if it's a word of comfort that he wants you to leave with or challenge or conviction or to give you new strength or just to enjoy being in his presence. But we're here to worship God. And so I want to just invite you to be quiet for a moment. Be still and say, Lord, I'm here to worship you. Do with me what you will. So let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, help us to be present this morning. Help us not just to go through the motions. Lord, protect us from being distracted by the evil one or by our own flesh. We open our our ears to hear your voice. We open our eyes. We want to see you. We open our hearts this morning to encounter you. So, Lord, thank you that you, you want to meet with us more than we want to meet with you. And, and so we pray, Lord, that you be glorified in all that happens here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to learn a new song this morning, and um, it's a song about the Holy Spirit. We're in the series of learning what the scriptures tell us about the Holy Spirit. And um, George is going to play the melody um, as we just... Uh, here, I want you just to hear where you can read the lyrics to the first verse, and then once we've heard it together, we'll go back and sing it um, together. So let's, let's hear it. Sing this beautiful prayer together.
last verse. your prayer. Will you say amen? Amen. Have a seat, please. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. It is really good to be together. My name is Benji. I serve as one of the pastors in this church family. And every now and then we get the chance to celebrate and make some agreements alongside a young family in our church through what we call our parent and child dedication. And we get to do that here this morning. So I'm gonna invite you guys on up. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in a moment. Um, wow. You guys walked up the stairs and they clapped for you. I mean, this is, this is excellent. You're, cr you're crushing your day already. Um, so... These parents, as many do in our children's ministry, they went through a process of thinking really intentionally about what they hope for spiritually for their kids. And many of us who are parents know that that is a process that we do about lots of aspects of life. And we ask them to think, hey, what would it look like to parent with the end in mind when it comes to spiritual things? And so I'm going to have them introduce themselves. They have a verse that they picked out. They're going to introduce their family. And then I've got some words for you and some words for us as well. So I'm Eric, this is Tiffany, and do you want to say your name? William. There you go. And William. <laughs> and Sophia on the end is who we're dedicating this time. And then, okay, so we have two verses. The first is, uh, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. And the other is, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Um, true story, this morning when I was thinking and praying about what are we going to do, um, the scripture that I wrote down on my sheet was, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And then I thought, man, I should really look up what verse they picked. And it really did go in that order, I promise. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Because if this is true of spiritual children, we can imagine even more so of our own biological families. And while there are no guarantees in the life of faith, there are no guarantees that the faith will pass to the next generation. Like John, we certainly find great joy when it does. And so I want to give you three thoughts on how to live toward that goal in mind with both of your children and Sophia in particular. And the first is this. I want to encourage you to live your own faith in front of your children. Just as they learned to talk by mimicking you and as just as they learned to walk by mimicking you, they are going to learn much about the life of faith by watching yours. They are going to learn much about the beauty of God from what you show them. So I charge you to prioritize your own faithfulness to Jesus, your own pursuit of God and becoming like Christ. Tell your kids not only the stories of God of old, but the stories of God of the day today, right now. Show them a living and active faith. So first, I want you to live your own faith in front of your children. Second, learn to do what's yours to do and learn the difference. Parenting very young children means that everything is yours to do. You have to take on every single responsibility. And some parents stay in that mode long after they ought to. But when it comes to the spiritual life, we know already that there is plenty that is beyond our control. And so I charge you to do your part to remain constant in prayer and asking the Spirit to do what only He can do. 
Ask the Spirit of God to invade the heart of Sophia, to reveal the beauty of Jesus to her. And by knowing your role, you will be both people marked by prayer and by peace as you learn to trust in God's plan for her. And finally, I want to encourage you to lean into your family. I know you have some family here today, and that is really a special thing to have surrounding you and wrapping around you. But you're going to need your spiritual family, too. You're going to need fellow disciples who will serve as examples and children's ministry leaders and teachers and small group leaders and prayer warriors for Sophia. Raising children to know and love God is a task that can only happen in the context of a spiritual family. And so I charge you, even in these very tired and very busy days, to lean into your church family. So as you long to know the joy of seeing Sophia walk in truth, decide today to live your faith your own faith in front of your children, to learn to do what's yours and to lean into your family. And if that is your intention, will you simply say, we will? And then church family, you just saw them make a commitment in front of you, but one that includes you and involves you. And so if you are willing to commit to help them to raise their children toward the goal of walking in truth and faithfulness to Jesus, will you simply say, we will? I hope you take that in. You are surrounded by a spiritual family who longs to see Sophia walking in truth as much as you do. In church family, because you just made that commitment, I want to tell you, you have opportunities to live into that very, very practically. Our children's ministry is a place where... <laughs> no, I don't know. They laughed at the nine, too. This isn't a joke. I'll make plenty of jokes. This isn't one of them. So... Our children's ministry is a place where we take discipleship of young people very seriously. And because of the way that we treat this as a family, it means that parents are involved. It also means non-parents are involved. And we need to do it together because we want to see young ones raised up, not just as humans, but as disciples of Jesus. And that takes all of us. So um, you can be on the lookout this week for an email coming to your inbox about how you can fulfill the covenant you just made in front of your church family. We're excited to see that. But I want to pray for you, good alls, and, and pray for Sophia in particular. God, we are grateful. We are grateful for Sophia's life. She bears your image. She is fearfully and wonderfully made. You delight in her already. And God, we delight in her in our church family. And Lord, we pray big things for her life. We pray that you would so invade her heart with your spirit that hers would be a story of your glory, your greatness, your goodness. Lord, would you cause her to bring great joy to Eric and Tiffany because she walks in truth. Lord, would you give them that delight because of your goodness. And would you show us our role in that and help us to be faithful to it. Would we walk alongside them as they seek to pursue you in their own lives and to point their children to you. God, we are insufficient for this task, so we pray your grace for each of us, and especially for Eric and Tiffany, and we long to see with great hopefulness what you're going to do in Sophia's life for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Now you can clap. So I want to tell you that one hope of this public dedication is to eventually celebrate another public declaration in the waters of baptism. Baptism is an outward sign of an inner reality, the transforming work of Jesus. Baptism dramatically pictures the death and burial of the old self and the rising to newness of life. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in Romans 6. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism is then both a sign of what Christ has done in one's life and a public identification with Christ's work and Christ's body, the church. And we have one of our own spiritual family members who is taking the step of baptism today, so excited about what's about to happen behind me. So I'm gonna get out of the way so it can happen. Good morning, church. Hello, hello. Um, I am going to let Abraham baptize, or not baptize himself, introduce himself. Um, but yes. Um, hi, I'm Abraham Chapman, and I'm in seventh grade. (laughs) 
Yes. So very excited for Abraham today, as all of us are. But just going to ask him a few questions, and then we're going to dunk him. So, Do you believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you affirm that you are a sinner in the eyes of the holy God? I do. Do you believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is for your sin and for your redemption? Yes. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit as the God who guides you and helps you in your entire life? Yes. With God's help, will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Yes. Putting your whole trust in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, do you desire to be baptized? Yes. Man, y'all, we have had so much church already. This is so good, so good. I am going to pray. I'm gonna pray for Abraham. I'm going to pray for Eric and for Tiffany and Sophia and for many other things. So I invite you to pray with me. God, we are struck again this morning by your goodness. We have so many reasons to declare your praise this morning. And we begin with what we just witnessed in the waters of baptism. We thank you for Abraham. We thank you for his faith in you. And that he is not only having a personal faith in his heart, but he is having a public faith where he is declaring alongside this church family that his intention is to follow you and glorify you with his life. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would sustain him for that task. Would you give him all he needs to know you more and more? and to follow you more faithfully. May he see more and more of your glory and your goodness and your beauty in the years ahead. Be faithful to him as he seeks to be faithful to you. And Lord, would you show us what it means to be faithful witnesses to your grace in his life? Would you show us what it means to walk faithfully alongside him? Would you give us the grace of being able to point him to Jesus even as we ourselves are seeking to be disciples. And Lord, we pray much the same for the good alls. We pray for Sophia. Lord, would her story one day lead to the waters of baptism? Would her story one day lead to public declaration of her own faith in the context of a church family who is dedicated to walking alongside of her? Lord, would you give Eric and Tiffany all they need for the task of parenting and discipling their children. Lord, that is a tall order, and they are not sufficient for us because none of us are. So Lord, would you give it what they need? Give them the Holy Spirit, fill them again. And Lord, we pray that you would do the same in us. Show us our role to disciple the next generation well, to point young and old to the truly good life in Jesus and the family of God. We need you. Work in and through us what is pleasing to you. And we pray that not just for our own sake, but we pray that, Lord, for the sake of the world that you created out of love and you long to see redeemed. You long to see every image bearer walking in the joy and freedom that comes only from knowing you. So, Lord, show us our place in declaring that message and living differently because of that message. Would you work in our community something that can only be credited to your goodness, your grace, and your power. And so, Lord, to that end, we pray for Ken as he prepares to come and teach us from your word. God, would you enliven your word in our hearts? Would these few minutes that we spend considering your word better prepare us to reflect your goodness, your grace, your holiness, your character? Would you make us more and more into the image of Jesus? And we pray this not for our sake, but for your sake, God. We believe that our best 
life is found in living like Jesus. And we also declare that your glory is found in those who do. So give us what we need that we might represent you well to a world longing to know the hope that is found only in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a um, couple announcements before Ken comes to teach. We've been talking a lot this morning about discipling young generations, and I want you to know one of the most exciting aspects of that that happens on this campus Monday through Friday is going on at Trinity Preschool. And the ground floor of the Christian Education Building Monday through Friday is just hopping with young people who are being taught about Jesus in a context that is marked by love and grace. And we have a room for somebody else to be a part of that team. And so if that is something that sounds appealing to you, you think, man, I've got, I've got my educational background in that. I would love to be a part of that. Um, the information's on the screen for how you could reach out to Ari and you can be a part of the great stuff going on at Trinity Preschool. Hey, right after the service, if you are new or you're visiting or you've been here for a couple decades and you consider yourself new, we have what we call coffee coffee. Connect. It's on my right, your left, on that side of the patio on the way out. And some of the elders, some of the staff, some longtime members of Santa Barbara community would just love to meet you, to hear a little bit more about your story as you learn a little bit more about our story and what it is to be a part of this goofy collection of people we call Santa Barbara Community Church. So um, my friends Evan, Alexa, and Heidi are walking around, and you've seen them. You didn't know that that was their names, but they are photographers. And you, some of you might be thinking, okay, why are there photographers on campus and walking around in our services? Well, we did this about five years ago, and while all of you look exactly the same as you did five years ago, um, I needed some photo refreshing. And so... We have a bunch of printed materials, our website, that um, is now out of date. And so we are excited about what's taking place today. So um, a couple things for you, church family. If you see them around, Evan or Alexa or Heidi, um, first of all, cooperate, smile, act like a normal church family so that we can preserve that. Um, but also you might see some of them moving around during different times in our service and after. I just wanted you to know that um, we know they're here and we invited them to be here. And so we're excited about that. Hey, the final thing, um, college students, where are you at? Okay. Um, it's cool. It's cool. We're going to do it all summer, I guess. Um, it's, many of you just got home and from, from elsewhere, and welcome home. It's good to have you. Many of, many of you graduated yesterday, and um, that's exciting, too. But if you're here, there's lunch for you after this service. You already crushed the first part of this slide. You came to church. Now stay for lunch. Caleb would love to hang out with you, and that'll be great. Um, that's all the announcements. And so would you stand and greet those around you as Ken prepares to come and teach us?
All right. I'm going to invite everybody to come on back now. We'll get into the Word of God together. <laughs> come on back now as we get into the Word of God together. And uh, let me actually pray for us as we get into the Word of God. Would you pray with me as we study the Word? Father, we thank you so much for blessing us with today. We thank you for everybody who's here. Lord, we thank you that you are a personal God and desires to speak to each of us individually and also collectively as a church family. So, Father, we ask that you would speak and that you would move and have your way with us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts here today be pleasing unto you pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Ken, one of the pastors here at the church, and we are currently in a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week, Mike, where'd Mike go? He was in the front. There you are, brother. <laughs> Mike, he taught us about the gifts of the Spirit. So for those of you who are here, let's say it again. Jerry, take us to the next slide, please. Say it together. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. Hopefully we haven't forgotten this. That was last week. The first week, Benji talked about the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Doing so, he took us back to his senior year in high school when the Macarena was topping the charts and when Jerry Maguire was packing out movie theaters before streaming occurred. And around the same time as that, I was on the East Coast. And on the East Coast, I was at a college retreat and I was doing my go-to move. Now, when I say go-to move, I'm not talking about playing basketball or football or even pro wrestling. These were all hugely important to me in my youth. Still now to this day in many ways. No, I'm talking about my go-to move, and this is super cringy, and I apologize. I would go, and I would grab my guitar, and I would go to an isolated part of the room, and I would start to play, and I would start to sing to impress, to impress the ladies. And so, <laughs> as horrible as that sounds, what made it more horrible was that it almost always worked. It was a great go-to move. And on that day, at that retreat, I did my go-to move, and soon there was this group of ladies around me listening to me sing. My wife, Jean Young, is here in this service, along with my parents, and I'm very embarrassed right now. <laughs> my wife, I could hear her rolling her eyes at me right now. One of my go-to songs, and I recognize the irony of this, was the old-school praise song, Refiner's Fire. Can I just see who knows the song? Yes, it's cringy to sing a song about being purified by God <laughs> to attract ladies. <laughs> but the lyrics go, for those of you who don't know, purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold. Should we sing it together? All right. Refine as fire, make it your prayer. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your so back in the mid-90s, here I am at this, retreat singing this, and at this retreat singing this song. And after my little Ken singing and swooning session, one of the pastors of the church came over to me to talk to me. And he asked me a question very lovingly. He said, Ken, what's this song about? And I thought about it and I was like, well, it's about being made holy and being purified by God. And then he followed that up with a question that kind of stumped me. I wasn't expecting. He asked me, well, what is the mood of the song? What's the vibe of the song? And I was like, wasn't expecting that. So I thought about it and I said, happy. Definitely happy. Yeah. Well, it's good to become more like God, so we should be happy when we sing it. And then he looked at me and he loved me. And he said, Ken, you are so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Refiner's Fire, it is a serious song. And it is a serious prayer. And we have to lift it up seriously. He said it was a scary song. 
and we should be scared to sing it because we need to consider the gravity of what we're lifting up to the Lord when we sing this song. And he went on and explained to me how precious metals were refined, and they were refined by fire until all the impurities were burned and stripped away. And so when we sing this song, Refiner's Fire, we're praying for God, God, put me through your fire. Put me through your fire. And that's going to hurt, and that's going to be uncomfortable, and that's going to be painful. And so when we're singing this song, it means that things will be taken away, that things will be cut out from our lives, that God is going to change our lives and we'll never be the same ever again. That's what this song is about. I'm kind of just laying a foundation for us here, and then we'll get into our sermon passage in a little bit. I love this sermon series that we're on in the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does, and it's so necessary that we explore who he is, because in so many ways, Francis Chan, I think he put it so well, he says, from my perspective, the Holy Spirit is tragically, tragically neglected and for all practical purposes forgotten. This is from his book, Forgotten God. While no evangelical would deny his existence, I'm willing to bet there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say they have experienced his presence or action in their lives over the past year. So as the Son was sent into the world to make known the Father, the Son sends the Spirit to reveal Christ. And one of the main ways we have to realize that Christ is revealed to the world is through us, God's people. Men and women who were originally created perfectly in the image of God, but since the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we have become marred and affected by sin. And yet, despite that, we are called to represent Christ in this world. And so the Holy Spirit... He indwells us and he empowers us and he transforms us as God's people to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And what the scriptures teach us, and ashamedly what I have too slowly learned, is the truth that God cares more about conforming us into the image of Christ rather than our own comfort or even our own happiness. That is so important that we understand that. For instance, an example of this, one of my favorite promises, I'm sure it's many, for many here too, Romans 8.28 might be a promise that we love. The Apostle Paul tells us, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This amazing promise of God that God will not just work out some things or just a few things, but all things in our lives, every single thing for our good. But we have to ask, well, what is this good that we're talking about? And so often we read the Bible and passages like this through rose-colored glasses. And we think that here that God is promising us unending joy and celebration and happiness and comfort. But this really gets blown away by the experience of God's people listed later in the same chapter. In Romans 8.35, the Apostle Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is not a random list here. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. This is the experience of God's people that they were undergoing. And yet, in the midst of that, Paul shares with us this promise. So what is this good that God promises us to those of us who love and are called according to his purpose? The goodness of God is defined for us, actually, in verse 29. In verse 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And so what is the purpose of all things working out together for our good? That we will be more like Jesus. That God will make us more and more like Jesus. The greatest good that God works in all of our lives is not our comfort, it's not our peace, it's not our happiness, but that we grow in our Christ-likeness. That every day we are made to be more and more like Jesus. And this is the necessary, and this is the hard, and this is the deep work that the Holy Spirit does within us. So ultimately we can say, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So with that, as kind of a foundation here, let's turn to our sermon passage for today. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll start at verse 13. Galatians 5, 13, we'll look at 13 to 26. Would you stand with me if you're able for the reading and honoring of God's word? Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. 
But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Have a seat, y'all. So what we're exploring today is the sanctifying, the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now when we first believe, I have to get into the theology here, when we first believe in the good news of Jesus Christ and we make the decision to follow after him, the fancy theological term for this is justification. Justification, Christ's perfection and righteousness covers our unrighteousness and we are saved from the penalty of sin. For many of us, justification is dealing with our salvation in the past tense. We were saved or we have been saved as our spirits are instantaneously saved when we believe in Christ's finished work in his earthly ministry and his death upon the cross. However, salvation, it does not end there for it is a continual process. And I think this is the part oftentimes that we neglect in the church where it's a continual process where we now grow in our sanctification. We grow in our personal holiness as we are made to be like Jesus Christ. And we are saved daily from the power of sin over our lives. Sanctification, it is the present work of the Holy Spirit who makes us holy like him. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. And we are being saved, present tense, through the ongoing salvation of our souls, which is our minds and our wills and desires, our hearts and our emotions. John Newton, the slave ship captain who would later become a Christian, he would pen the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. He would explain sanctification so well. He would write this. He would say, I am not what I ought to be. Ah, how imperfect and deficient. I am not what I wish to be. I I abhor what is evil and I would cleave to what is good. I am not what I hope to be soon. Soon I shall put off with mortality all sin and imperfection. Though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say that I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Sanctification is the ongoing deep work of the Holy Spirit, conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ, where we can look back over our spiritual journeys and say, as Newton once did, I am not what I once was. That is what we're talking about today. Now we're going to get into our passage in Galatians 5, but first we have to do some math. Now, I know it is not a great look for the one Asian guy on staff to be pushing math, but we got to do it, all right? (laughs) I'm just going to call it out, all right? It's just what it is, all right? I'm not that great at math, so it's okay. Um, It's Bible math, and so it's okay. Also, I was taught this by a non-Asian guy, so we're fine here. It's totally fine, all right? So the first thing is equation, Bible math. We have truth minus grace, and this equals... And each answer actually will, of course, start with the same letter, and the letter is L. Legalism is correct. Truth minus grace equals legalism. The flip side, Bible math, grace minus truth. Very good. You guys are on it. Very good. License. In our journeys as we're sanctified and conformed into the image of Christ, we tend to fall into one of these two equations, if you will. Legalism, let's talk about legalism first. Legalism, it is the imposition of wrong rules, more rules, or stressing and emphasizing certain rules over other ones so that the person is left to his or her own devices and performance to try and earn God's love, to earn God's favor. 
legalism is, the statement essentially, I have to keep the rules so that God will accept me. Legalism is, I have to keep the rules so that God will accept me. Some of us fall in this side, on this side. And then on the flip side, we have license. And when I say license, what I'm meaning is a disregard, a deviation, or a departure from the truth. License, or the fancy theological term for this is antinomianism, anti-namas, namas in the Greek meaning law, so anti-law, this idea that my freedom allows me to live however I want, however I think, however I feel, however I desire, that the rules don't apply to me. And license is summed up with the statement and the belief, I can do whatever I want because God accepts me. You see the, 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 the nuance there between legalism and license. And so those of us on the license side, we tend to look for loopholes and we push the boundaries to see what we can get away with and how much we can get away with here. This is what the Apostle Paul is addressing in the beginning of Galatians chapter 5 here in our passage. The church family is growing. The gospel is going out. More and more people are coming to believe. And they're coming now to form the church together. And we have people who are coming from Jewish traditions, and we have those who have Gentile backgrounds. Now, many of the Jewish Christians, they believed that the Gentiles, y'all have to first come, become Jews first. You have to become Jews in order to come to salvation in Christ. So you have to follow these rules. Get circumcised. Follow these strict dietary laws. And if you do all these things, then you will be accepted. In this camp, the people here oftentimes are called the Judaizers. They had the legalistic mindset. You must follow these rules in order to be accepted by God and us. But Paul and many of the New Testament authors, they, strong, they write very strongly on this, that this is wrong. Because it's not faith plus works that leads to salvation, but it is faith in Jesus Christ alone. And we are now free as new creations in Jesus Christ. But just like any pendulum swing going from legalism to license, oftentimes any pendulum swing, it swings too far. So now there are many who have swung too far, and there are now many Gentile believers who are now using their freedom to engage in sin, to engage in idolatry. And Paul is now correcting this mindset of license here too. But we see these two camps of legalism and license. The scholars N.T. Wright and Michael F. Byrd, they have observed this. They say, Paul's opponents are implying there are only two ways to live. The Jewish way, observing Torah, legalism, or the Gentile pagan way, still enslaved to idols, license. No, says Paul, there is a third way, a double freedom, into which you are released and transformed by the new exodus that God has accomplished in Jesus the Messiah, and that results in love. So let's go back to our math equations and review once again. Truth minus grace equals legalism. Grace minus truth equals, and then we have truth plus grace equals love. Very good. A plus for y'all today. Coming from an Asian, very good. The scriptures <laughs> declare, the scriptures make it very clear that we as believers in the gospel and the people belong to God, we are called to be free. Amen. We are free from the law. We are free from the uncertain life of attempting to earn the grace and favor of God. However, our freedom is not meant for the enjoyment of sin. And our freedom is not meant to tear down and injure and hurt the family of God. But rather, as we're talking about here, it is to love. Grace plus truth equals love. And Paul reminds us that the way of the Spirit is to love and serve one another. And this is the true fulfillment of the law. That we are called as the family of God, as the people of God, we are called to be one and called to love and serve each other. Paul then, he continues in our passage, we're going to look at starting from verse 19 now, going into these lists. And he continues by contrasting, there is the life enslaved to our sinful nature, and then there is the life surrendered to the Holy Spirit. In studying this list, I think one scholar, he puts it very, very well he says, the seemingly chaotic arrangement of these terms is reflective of the chaotic nature of evil. If you look at the list of the, the works of the sinful nature, it is somewhat of a chaotic, kind of messy list as you go through it. But this chaos is to be contrasted with the oneness of the fruit of the Spirit and its orderly arrangement. And so in trying to break down this list, if you'll follow along with me, 
and give some structure and organization to the list of the sinful nature, we'll try to give some categories and try to form them. And so first we see sins of a, a sexual nature. And I believe that this is important that we realize this, and I think it is very much intentional. And when we look at the other epistles where the Apostle Paul gives us lists of sins, we see one in Romans as well, 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, and Colossians 2. In all of those times when he talks about a list of sin, sexual sin is actually always placed first. And I believe that this might be for two reasons. First of all, God's people were living in and have always lived in a very sexualized world. So often we think that this is only happening now. No, there is nothing new under the sun, number one. Number two, sexual sin, it can have such a huge strong, a stronghold over us in our lives. And so this is why we as a church, we have addressed and will continue to address this tough and messy and complicated but oh so important topic so that we as God's people, we can learn to grow in the correct position and posture of loving people in this sexualized world. That we would hold the right conviction, hugely important, and also the right compassion, hugely important, in loving people in this sexualized world. Because once again, grace plus truth equals love. But look with me here. If you have your Bible, follow along with me here, starting from verse 19. In Galatians 5, 19, starting from there, we have sins of a sexual nature, sexual immorality, promiscuity, things of that sort. We have sins dealing with worship and religion. We have sins of the heart that affect and ruin our relationships with others. And then we also have sins of overindulgence and excess too. Now, there's not clear-cut divisions or categories that sometimes people, they would actually commit sexual sin with cult temple prostitutes or they would get drunk at parties held to worship false gods. But what is absolutely clear is that those who follow these ways, according to this list, that they are not living in the spirit, they are not being conformed into the image of the Son, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God the Father. I think that is very clear. Along with that, we see contrasted, we see the fruit of the Spirit. And it's mentioned here, the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, when I was in college, a pastor went over this passage and they said, how many fruit of the Spirit was, are there? And all of us raised our hands and we read it quickly and we were trying to like get a prize, I guess. We were like, nine! And he said, incorrect. And we like went back at it again. We're like, one, two, three, nine. <laughs> he said, that is incorrect. And then we just were like, eight? I don't know. <laughs> so, and he was like, no, it's not eight either. And so he went through and he explained to us, the correct answer is actually one. Uh, the, it's one because the word fruit in the original Greek is actually singular. And so we're talking about one fruit of the Spirit. That there is one fruit of the Holy Spirit but we are given graciously nine different attributes, nine different descriptions of this fruit of the Spirit and that we're given here. Of course, the question is, well, who perfectly exemplified them all? And the answer, of course, is the youth group answer of Jesus. That. And so when we are talking about growing in the fruit of the Spirit, some people would even talk about it's the fruit of Christ-likeness. As we grow to become more and more like Christ, then we are now being conformed to the image of Christ and he's purifying us and sanctify us so that we will become like the one who was and is and forever will be perfectly loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and full of self-control. We started off today by talking about fire. And so we're going to close talking about fire as well. When I was younger... When I heard about fire in the church, um, or when I read through it and read about it in the scriptures, I always thought this charismatic Korean Christian um, always thought that it meant about being hot. Like we need to, it's talking about heat and how we need to have a lot of passion and a lot of excitement and zeal for God. And so we wanted our worship times to be hot and intense. We wanted our prayer times to be loud and long. We wanted to be passionate people who are on fire for the Lord. And so this is what I thought fire primarily meant. But then when I went to seminary, I had this professor. He taught two of my classes, interpreting the New Testament and the book of Revelation. 
And he was a fiery professor. He was a scary professor as well. Every day in class, he would just choose one or two students randomly to look at the roll call and just be like, Mike, stand up. And we'd have to stand up. And he would just be like, he would just turn to a random passage in the New Testament. John 13, 8. Translate it from the Greek. And you just have to do it on the spot. If, and if you couldn't do it, fail for the day. And he just loved us all just being like that, just terrified, just living in terror of him. Uh, his expertise was on the book of Revelation. He has a very long commentary on the book of Revelation. Students, we somewhat lovingly referred to him as the beast. And um, <laughs> he taught us how to interpret the Bible. And one of the tools that he went over with us was a word study. Many of us know about this, a word study. You take a particular word in the Bible, you look at how it's used throughout the Old Testament, you look at how it's used all the way through the New Testament, and also in ancient writings, too, that were written around the same time periods as well. And so you kind of like look at this word throughout these different uh, pieces of literature. And so we did this, and we did a word study on the word fire. And sometimes the word fire, it talks about heat. But more frequently, almost always, fire, it represents cleansing. It represents purifying, and as we sang, it represents refining. And over and over again, what we see is actually God sends down his fire before doing something very special and powerful in a person's life, usually preparing that person to be commissioned out for service and leadership. A few examples of this. In Genesis 15, we see God makes a holy covenant with Abram with fire. God calls Moses to leadership through a fire, the fire of the burning bush. And where Moses stood was called holy ground. Before giving the Ten Commandments, God, he came in thunder and lightning and smoke and fire. Before declaring, here am I, send me, Isaiah, he saw his sin and was cleansed with holy fire. Go to the New Testament. We see in the New Testament, Jesus declares that he came to bring fire on the earth. We'll look at this in a couple of weeks. But when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he came in fire. And I remember hearing about this and learning about this. And I was like, it truly is everywhere. And I remember I was going through the Gospel of John. I got to John 21 where Peter is being reinstated and restored. And I looked and I was like, and there was a fire. Jesus also used that fire to cook breakfast for his disciples. And my question always is, Jesus is the Son of Man and the Son of God. He is forever good. But is Jesus a good cook? That's the question I always have. <laughs> I want to taste the food that Jesus made. Random question. Okay. My favorite passage in the Bible about fire 1 Kings 18. In 1 Kings 18, we see the showdown between Elijah, the one sole prophet of God, and the prophets of a false god named Baal. And it was a contest of fire. Whose god could send down, rain down fire from heaven? Now, Baal, he was the Canaanite god of rain and nature. He was often depicted as wielding a lightning bolt. So sending down fire from heaven right up his alley. He should have easily won this contest. And yet, as we read in the story, the prophets of Baal, they cry out to him for hours, and they dance around for hours, but nothing happens. And then eventually, Elijah, when he's like, y'all done? Then he comes up, and he asks the idolatrous people of God, he asks them a question. And he asks them, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And what's very interesting is the word used here for waver in the Hebrew. It's describing the wavering, the limp hearts of God's people. It's actually the same word used for the prophets of Baal as they were limping and leaping and dancing around the altar. And instead of having hearts of strong conviction and faith, God's people were guilty of playing games with God. And so often we're, we're the same too that we're oftentimes limping and wavering as they place their trust in idols and the temporary things of this world. Elijah then, he draws the people close. You could read the story yourself and kind of like see all the, 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 the details there, but he prepares the sacrifice, lifts up the short prayer to the Lord, and God sends down fire, his holy fire. And his holy fire, it purifies and it cleanses the people's hearts because before they couldn't answer this question, they hesitated and were not able to answer. But after God sent down his holy fire from heaven, the people now respond immediately, the Lord, he is God. 
the Lord, he is God. I'm going to lead us to the table in a moment, but today I'm going to encourage you, take your time in coming up to receive communion. And let's have just a, a longer time, a little bit of prayer. Because I'm going to show this list again in a moment of the sinful nature and the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm going to encourage all of us, read through the list. And more importantly, pray through the list. And allow the Spirit to speak and to move. To have his way in your heart and your life. Because again, God desires to do his good work in us. But as we've been talking about today, this involves the Spirit cleansing and purifying. And refining us with his holy fire. Which again means that things may hurt. It may hurt and that things may change, but God desires to heal and transform us. And so consider the gravity of it. If you don't know what to pray, you can just pray this very simple prayer. Spirit, would you send your holy fire into my life today? Spirit, I'm open to you. Would you send your, your holy fire into my heart and life today? And let's just be open to whatever the Lord decides to do. And may we trust that it will be for our good to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit and also to become more and more like Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for, your, for the forgiveness of sins. Church family, this meal is open for all of us who know Christ and who will know our great need for his mercy and grace. It's not for the perfect, it's not for the proud, it's not for the strong, but for those of us who are desperate for him and desperate need for his grace. So if you're not sure what this means or you have need prayer for anything else that we're talking about today, we will have prayer teams available today. And so let's just kind of press in now and see the Lord in prayer. I'm going to put this list up here. And so when we experience the promise of blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, I desire for us to have a clearer vision of God today. Let's pray.
Yes, Lord, we pray that you would continue to transform us into the image of Christ, that we would lay before you all of our lives, our whole life, daily, so that you can do with it what you want. Lord, not, not our glory, but yours, not our comfort, but your joy. Truly, Lord, would you remind us how good it is to be conformed to the image of Christ. We need your help for this. We need you to transform our desires and our thoughts, our attitudes. So, Lord, have your way in us, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to go with one more just to remind ourselves that it is good to be transformed by God, even if it's painful in the moment. It's good to be his people. Thank you. 
will receive this benediction as you go to give your life to the Lord. And, and just picture him running after you with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face full of pleasure and joy and for your best towards you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week.